Whenever something comes up, I run. I don't walk. I run to the promises of the Lord. I run to what has God spoken to me? What has he said to me last? What is it that he has deposited in my heart about this season? Most people could, you, you would do well if you just returned to the last thing God told you. But sometimes because of anxiety and fear and all the junk that goes on in our lives, we, we tend to drop the things that God has given us. 1 Kings 19, verse 5. Then he's, as he lay, he slept under a broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. This is the first record of angel food cake. Uh, <laughs> and, in the, in the history of the planet, this is the first one, which is in comparison with demons filling the pigs, creating deviled ham. So we've got lots of recipes in the Bible. I know. I know. Apparently, we don't always go from glory to glory. So. <laughs> All right, verse six again. He looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and he went in the strength of that food 40 days, 40 nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. The Lord took this moment for Elijah and intensified the feeding program because it would be followed by a season with no food. Yeah. Now, seasons of no food is never punishment. It's, it's to help us to refine our focus, to rediscover what he's already fed us. Yeah. If he is silent, it's because he's already spoken. His silence, some of you grew up in homes where, you know, punishment was just, I won't talk to you anymore. And give the silent treatment. And, and, and it's hard not to project that onto the father. And so it's automatically for us to think I've done something wrong. And certainly if somebody's living in out and out rebellion and they're, they're in known sin and refuses to repent, well, then, then obviously there's, that's another issue. But when we live as we do to serve the Lord, to honor the Lord with everything we are, everything we have, and there's silence, he wants us to revisit our history. See, there's something unique about the testimony of the Lord. And when the Lord has spoken to you through scripture, or there's a healing of cancer, or the deliverance of torment, doesn't matter what it is, when the Lord is active in our lives, it creates a testimony. And that testimony is a living entity. It, it, it's, it's, I don't know how to describe it. I've never been able to describe it well, but I just know it's, it's alive now. It never dies. All throughout eternity, everything he has ever done for any person will be actively alive, proclaiming his nature, his greatness, his covenant, all throughout eternity. It never, ever dies. And so when you and I have history with God in scripture and, and we have the Lord meet with us in certain uh, situations of our life, maybe we're looking for direction, um, you know, uh, uh, something very positive, a promotion of some sort. Maybe it's, it's a crisis, but it doesn't matter what it is. In those moments we read and he begins to feed us, history is created there, underline it, mark it, do something so that, so that, uh, so that you can revisit, and if you'll revisit with affection, listen to me carefully, if you'll revisit the moment, you're not conjuring up, you're not trying to control or manipulate God, you're just coming in with thankfulness for the God who met with you at this burning bush, yeah. and you visit it once again, something gets reignited. That's right. it's, 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 it's as alive in this moment as it was 20 years ago when it happened. Yeah. And if we can learn to steward our moments, then we realize that anytime we come into a place of silence, all he's doing is helping to direct my soul into where his voice is still active. It's in what he has already said. It's in what he's already done. 
So he directed me to this portion of scripture and I, I realized in the reading of it that he was, he was giving me enormous amounts of spiritual food, if you will. The Bible says that we live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We live because he speaks. We live, we live literally because he, he talked it into us. And reconnecting with that life. I had a guy that, that told me once, he said, I get so much from one verse in the Bible, I just don't need to read anymore. <laughs> I didn't read what was on the screen, but what came up on my screen is basically, you're an idiot. <laughs> Can you imagine going into the world's best restaurant ordering Wagyu beef. If you're a vegetarian, this doesn't work with a carrot or anything. My illustration is not going to, it's just not going to work. So just pretend you're a meat eater. Vegetarians in Bethel are the most grace-filled people because they have to forgive me every day of my life. So I love you and I bless you. But let's say you sit down to order that, that Wagyu beef. It's about this thick. It's so perfectly cooked. You slice the meat I'm going to keep you here an extra hour today. You slice, slice, you take the first bite. Angels begin to sing all around you. Their wings, their wings begin flapping. Out of your innermost being comes a new song. A new song for the new season. Probably languages you've never spoken in before. Can you imagine taking that one bite and going, that was so good, I don't need another. By the time I finish that one, I'm trying to figure out how do I get the next one. I, I really have nothing planned tomorrow. <laughs> when you taste of his goodness, there is no, there's no restricted involvement. There's only abandonment. When you taste and see that the Lord is good, you want to cast yourself completely into the pool of his goodness to experience everything you possibly can because it's the one thing that really matters. So I, I remember, honestly, I remember as though it were yesterday where he spoke hour after hour after hour after hour and directed me to this passage of Scripture and I realized, okay. And so that night was followed by the 40 days. If you think you've done something wrong, you'll look for problems. If you realize his nature, you'll look for presence. I remind you, he said, I'll prepare a table, place of intimacy and fellowship, nourishment. I'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. There is grace for every moment. There's grace for every season. More than enough. He's extravagant. He's not wasteful. He made sure to pick up all the loaves and fishes that weren't eaten because he doesn't waste. I think God can trust you with abundance if you're not wasteful. But some people display their wealth by their waste. It's not good stewardship. You never have so much that you can waste. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Who does the deliverance come, from, come to? The people who set their love on him. <clears throat> I don't want to twist the meaning of this. So again, everything, do everything to resist any kind of guilt, shame, or whatever. To me, this is an invitation by God to learn what it is to fix the affection of our hearts to be anchored in him continuously. He, he makes a point for a reason. Because he set his love on me, I deliver him. I know uh, when I'm home, I, I tell my wife that I love her uh, many times a day. Many times a day. Uh, many times, sometimes during a meal. Uh, it's going to be repeated frequently. I'm going to reset. I've already set my love on her, but I reset 
See, in Acts chapter two, it says, and they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, to fellowship, etc. They continually, continually devoted. They continually re-upped the contract, re-signed the contract. There's something about this passage that provokes me. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. There's something about the ongoing, I hate to reduce it to a discipline, but if that's what it takes, do it. The ongoing resetting of our affection for him throughout a day. If you need it, set it on your alarm to remind you. The resetting of our heart of affection for him. There's something about that. He's such a lover that he's drawn. You know, I've, I've talked about this for the year, through the years. But I, uh, in going to sleep at night, I turn my affection towards him. When I go into a difficult situation, I'll stop, turn my affection towards him until I can sense his presence resting upon me. It's not that he wasn't before, but something happens. Either he comes or I become aware. I don't care what it is, I like it. Turn my affection towards him and something happens in that moment where there, there is a manifest presence of God upon me for whatever environment I walk into. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've told you before, um, I, I remember a store I used to shop in that uh, it was a grocery store, but it had cultic stuff there too. And, uh, and I loved to shop there. And I remember the owner taking me aside one day. Before I'd walk in, I'd just stand at the door. I was at, I'd go to the back door, I'd just stand at the door and and just turn my affection towards the Lord, make sure that I could sense the Spirit of God resting upon me. Then I would walk in and just shop. I, I wouldn't do anything different than anyone else. But the owner took me aside one day and said, Bill said, something is different when you walk in the room. I know it's because the manifest presence of God resting upon me. So this is what he's saying. He said, because you set your love on me, therefore I will deliver so I, I just pray right now that every one of us upgrade that resetting of the affection of our heart for him. Not just reduced to a discipline, but the increasing passion of the Lord would become our passion. I remember a prophetic word I heard, oh goodness, it was probably 1972, it was before I was married, which was 73. I, I remember sitting in a, in a service in Bethel Church, the other old location, and this, this woman prophesied, and she said, um, uh, if you long for me as I've longed for you, you will be satisfied. Ah, if you long for me. What does it mean to set your love on God? It means you've received his love. Do you know that? Do you know the scripture says, we love him because he first loved us? Do you know when I love him, I only love him, him back with what he gave me? He, when I opened up my heart to receive his love, he gave me the capacity to love him back. Strangely, in scripture, you see instruction on the husband to love the wife, but the wife to respect the husband. Why? Because if the husband does a good job loving the wife, she doesn't need to be commanded to love in return. Come on. And all the women said, yes, amen. <laughs> but you, you get the point, you get the point. The point is, is, is it's, it's actually carried on in the illustration of Christ and his church, the husband and the wife. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. I'm not sure what it means. My mind goes quickly to being seated in heavenly places. And it's that particular passage, uh, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ, is a wonderful, wonderful truth. The problem that I have, not with the verse, but with the issue, is it gets reduced to a point of theology 
and never becomes an experience. Yeah. Heavenly places is supposed to be a place from which we think and from which we see. Yeah. It's not a mind over matter thing. It's not a, you know, discipline our minds to imagine this and imagine that. It's not that. It's that, it's that our love runs so true with him. <clears throat> the resetting of our hearts of affection towards him becomes so ongoing that we not only have the point of theology that is accurate, we are seated in heavenly places, but we actually think and see from that place because our burning heart of affection for him and his burning heart for us brings us into such a place that our perception changes. Everything changes because in that abiding place of presence, we think and we see different. See, it's that person that can say to the disease. It's that person, as John G. Lake discovered, to hold the disease in his hand, put it under the microscope and watch it die. Not everyone could have done that. Why? Because not everyone has life flung from them continuously. If you take a garden hose and you put it in foul, putrid water, whatever's in that puddle is going to leak into the hose. The only way to keep the inside of the hose unaffected is that before you put it into the stuff, make sure the water's turned on. And if there's a continual flow through the hose, you can put it in any environment and it doesn't get infected. We got people setting up barriers of protection around themselves because they don't have enough flowing out. You get the stuff flowing through you, that yieldedness. Yieldedness, not yieldedness just for the sake of power, but yieldedness because of this romance, because of this love, because I've set my heart of affection on it. Suddenly there's stuff flowing from us that starts changing. The atmosphere starts changing the environment that we walk into. We've been called into this for this season. This is the season of advancement. All right, we're getting close to the end. That's right. We're now. <clears throat> Verse 14 again, look at it in your Bible. Verse 14 again, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high. It's actually a place of, of safety, uh, in a sense, unreachable. Uh, by the way, the scripture teaches pretty clearly that we are out of reach of the enemy, but not out of sight. Mm -hmm. That's, good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's why he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Come on. You're out of reach, but you're, you're not out of sight. Why? I think the Lord loves to torment the devil. That's just my thought. I think he rather enjoys. And you know what? You're sitting at, at a table and you've got the enemy all around you. What is your attention on? Any situation where you feel like you're under heavy assault, if you'll, if you'll refine your focus, you'll find the table of fellowship. He prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. If all you see is the enemy, then you need to readjust, get back to what God has said about your life, find the table of communion. But in that table of fellowship with God is, your, is all of our place of great strength, great confidence, great life, great health. Um, don't ever estimate peace because it's the manifestation of his mind over you. The, the peace of God is, the, is a manifestation of his mind having effect on your environment because he's not nervous about anything. If, if you're anything like me, you have the ability to make a mountain out of a molehill and to take the simple and make it very complex. It's a gift. I, I have that gift. <laughs> And uh, hang around me long enough and I'll show you how to do it. Um, it but it's, it's, it's really true. And, but what happens for us, many of us, as we walk with the Lord, we tend to exaggerate the size of our problems so we feel justified in our fear. 
We exaggerate the size of our problem so that our anxiety is logical. Yep, yeah, we need to read the Bible. That's what we need to do. I can tell. We're going to, let's read the scripture together. The Psalms 23. How many of you memorized this maybe even as a child? You, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably the most well-known portion of scripture on the earth. It is quoted. It is, you know, a TV show. Somebody dies as a priest doing a funeral. Oftentimes they will quote at least part of the 23rd Psalm. And it's famous or well-known for good reason. It is that good. The problem with it is we're too familiar with it. Some of the richest things, I, I, I often come in my reading, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, Lord, help me to read this for the first time again. Help me to read this for the first time. Sometimes just simplifying things, sometimes changing a translation, reading a different translation because I'll hit it from a different angle. Any, any of you ever write something? And when you were through, you proofread it and everything was perfect and somebody else read it and they said, hey, you forgot a word here? Amen. But you, could, you read the word when you... <laughs> I have entire paragraphs that I see on the page, but it's not there. That's, that's why God gave us editors right. created by God to help us not look stupid when we certainly could. So. But sometimes we do that automatic reading thing, if you will, uh, familiarity cause us to skip over things that we really need to hear as though it were the first time. So I pray that today would have that effect on you as it's having on me. Psalms 23 verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, even Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is just a a glorious psalm that needs to be revisited. Verse one says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oftentimes for us, we don't have a financial problem, we have a lordship problem. The issue of lordship, the Lord is my shepherd, is where this begins. And it doesn't ignore that there's conflict, that there's warfare, that there's devils, that there's darkness. It doesn't ignore any of that. It just gives us an insight as to how he takes us through that process, not for defeat, not for fear, not for anxiety, but for triumph, that his name would be exalted and we will be strengthened. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We are the worst at diagnosing our own problems, our own circumstances. And there are many who think they have relational problems and they actually have lordship problems. There are many who struggle with fear and anxiety and it's only the result of the absence of lordship. It's, if I, and I can, I can take any small problem and make it so large in my mind that I forget who Jesus is. But no problem is impressive. No problem looks big in the face of the one who defeated everything on our behalf. In the face of the one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Sometimes the Lord yokes us together with people, uh, maybe in a work context, maybe it's a family upbringing, could be any number of things, but he yokes us together and the, uh, when you're yoked with someone, the yoke only hurts when you try to go a different direction than they're going. Yeah. Right. When you try to sit when they're s sitting, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the fact the Lord is actually using the circumstances around us to teach us to walk like Jesus. And sometimes the pain we feel that we are so certain is, is somebody else's fault is actually a Lordship issue. Yep, we can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord, the master, the ruler, the wonderful, gracious father, the benevolent, kind, uh, caring leader that we have, he directs my life. And I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you my greatest, my greatest weakness over the last 40 years, it comes up, I'm embarrassed to say how often it has come up. My greatest weakness has been that I assume that I know the will of God in a matter. And, and it's, it's, never, it's never a choice between, you know, something evil and something good or something moral versus immoral or honest versus dishonest. That's not the, it's not the issue. Those issues have long been settled. It's the issue of doing the right thing that God has directed or the right thing hoping that he'll bless it. A, a good thing. And he's such a great father, sometimes he covers me, you know. He says, yeah, I'll cover you, you know. <laughs> you just do something, you know, in his name that he wasn't a part of, but he goes, yeah, it was close. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and he's, he's, just that, he's just that kind of a father. And I'm so thankful for that because he saved me out of a bunch of dumb stuff. But other times he just leaves me hanging. <laughs> and, but it's, it's, not, it's, not like it's, it's not like he's punishing me, it's just like, son, if you can feel the pain of the moment you're in, it'll help your memory. <laughs> the next time you get in that situation where you think you already know what I want from you. Does that make sense to anybody else? I, I just feel like I already know. I saw him do this, this, and this. So obviously this is what he wants. And that's not always the case. It's that assumption that gets me into trouble. I, I receive a, a lot of encouragement, especially from David in his life. I think, I think maybe his, his life is the one that speaks to the, me the most. Uh, of where there were times where maybe he would forget to pray or, or he sought the Lord on the most obvious details. Uh, he, would, he would pray for things that I wouldn't even think to pray for. I'd just assume, well, this is what God wants. And it's, it's he's, he's Lord. He's Lord. He, he's, he's the King of glory. He's the Lord of all lords. He is my Savior. He is my benevolent dictator. He is a kind and perfect father. He's loving and he covers me and he empowers me, but he is Lord and it's never to be forgotten. He is absolutely Lord and Lord of all. And every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That, that moment, that day is coming, but we have the privilege of doing it every day of our life. And here he starts this Psalm by describing the condition of a disciple. It doesn't mean, when it says, I shall not want, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to have another need tomorrow. It doesn't mean I don't have a difficult decision to make. It doesn't mean any of those things. It doesn't mean if you have a problem in your life, then, you, then Jesus obviously isn't your Lord. That's the opposite in this, this psalm. This psalm is describing how to, how to live life in such a way that regardless of your circumstances, you always come into a place of breakthrough because Jesus is Lord. And he noticed in the psalm, he says, for my name's sake, every victory that you and I experience, all of creation celebrates Jesus for your victory. Wow. Why? Because they see his plan worked. Wow. The scripture says, wherever two or three of us are gathered in his name, he is in the midst. Well, he's already in me. But there's an increased measure of presence when we come together in his name. So we have two or three of us gathered in his name, Jesus stands in the midst. All of creation celebrates it because his plan worked. It was actually possible to create something in people who are born again, the capacity for unity that only the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have known throughout all eternity. And all of creation looks at that and they said, it worked. And there's this celebration of who he is. So when he says, for his namesake, he's actually describing that it is imperative, it is vital that all of creation sees and witnesses the effect of his plan. In fact, Romans chapter eight talks about all of creation groaning and travailing. We got some good music going on somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the beauty of cell phones. Yes. I, I, at one meeting I said, you know, somebody needs to get the Hallelujah Chorus so that when your phone rings, it's kind of a moment of celebration. So that night they had the Hallelujah Chorus on their phone. So. Yeah. So the Lord, the Lord is looking for, for one simple thing. It's, 
or acknowledgement of His Lordship. It's not complicated. It may be hard, but it's not complicated. Jesus is Lord. And in that place, there is such rich fulfillment that it is possible for you and me to stand in the face of adversity, difficulty, challenges, whatever we might be facing, and say, because He's my shepherd, I actually am lacking nothing. And it's in that context that we are able to testify of His goodness in our lives. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Some of you need to be made to lie down. <laughs> made to lie down. He, he, uh, he leads me beside still or quiet waters. Um, I had a phrase go through my mind here uh, a few weeks ago in, in uh, Sydney. Let's see if this helps anyone. Um, many of us struggle with guilt and shame in equal measure to our overemphasis of our own role in our conversion. Many of us struggle with guilt and shame in equal measure to our overemphasis of our role in our own conversion. Do we have a role? Yeah, I chose him, but he first chose me. I love him, but he first loved me. I put my faith in him, but the faith was a gift from God. And anytime we overemphasize, we overtake responsibility. When in fact, he's looking to lead us into a place of abandonment and trust. Maturity is where I represent him well in power, in wisdom, in love. But I remain as a child. I never grow out of dependency. I only grow deeper in dependency. The issue of lordship will be an issue throughout all of eternity. But it's never restrictive in a sense of, of punishment. It's never a restriction in a sense of um, con, uh, confinement of who you were born to me, to be. Instead, it's a restriction so that all your efforts can be put into who you were designed to be. It's, it's, con, it's a controlled strength, if you will. It's a directed strength, a better term, directed strength. And so the Lordship of Jesus is always with your eternal purpose. My eternal purpose is always in mind, that we could stand fully representing Jesus accurately. I, I really believe that before he returns, there's going to be a generation, not just in individuals, but a generation that represent him well in purity, true holiness, great power, great wisdom, which automatically means there's going to be transformation of cities and nations as a result. All right. So he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. The word soul there, now oftentimes when we read, uh, see the word soul, we think in terms of mind, will, and emotion, which is legitimate. But this word is used, um, it's like 750 times in the, in the Bible. And it's often used to describe us in our whole, our whole person, spirit, soul, and body, everything about us. So when he says, he restores my soul, it's saying, he restores me completely. Everything about me becomes healthy again. Yeah. Sign me up for that one. That's a good one. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. There's that phrase again. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Here's one of the most important things I saw in that particular season for me. I'll be honest. I was, I was, uh, I was sick. And, uh, and I, I kept waiting for that word of the Lord. I kept waiting for that, that thing that would clarify everything for me. And, uh, and it, just, it just didn't come. It, his silence, whenever he's silent, it's not punishment. It's because he's already spoken. And he's, his silence will help you to find what he's already said. It's, it's not the silent treatment. He's not like you and me giving each other the silent treatment. He's, he's, uh, he's a gracious father, so everything is out of love. Everything is out of love. And, um, and I was hoping to get, you know, that word. I was hoping that somebody would call or somebody would write. And, and there were a lot of things given to me, and it was all wonderful, but there was never that breakthrough word, that breakthrough moment. It just didn't come. All there was was sick and, you know, 
I was in the hospital for a while. There was two people with kidney transplants that came in and left before I did. <laughs> yeah, and there was a third person that was there when I got there. So they all graduated before I did. So I was, I was there for a while, and I'm just praying. I'm just looking for that word. I had great friends come and pray for me, talk with me. So it was wonderful, N- zero complaint. But I was looking for that breakthrough word, and it never came. What did come was overwhelming peace. And after I looked back and I could say two things, two things I came out of with. Number one, bold faith stands on the shoulders of quiet trust. Bold faith stands on the shoulders of quiet trust. What he was looking for in me was not the expression of bold faith. He was looking for me, the quiet trust. He was trying to build something deeper in me where I had been working to illustrate, demonstrate, pursue bold faith. He was looking to develop a rest in me that it enabled or allowed for a quiet trust to be the platform on which another level of bold faith would come. Does that make any sense? I hope so. But here's the, here's the main deal that I wanted to mention to you this morning. As he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you're with me. I'll fear no evil because you're with me. I, I, came, I came to the realization that there are measures or manifestations of his presence that you can only find in the valley of the shadow of death. He manifests himself differently in different contexts, in different situations. And there's an aspect of his presence you can only find in that context. Why would he take you through the valley of the shadow of death? because he believes in the work he's done in you. He's confident of the great work that he's he's done in each one of us. He's confident enough that he can trust us in perilous situations. If it wasn't a true, sufficient new creation that took place inside of our hearts when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, if that were not a reality, he would never put us in that, that environment because we'd be devoured, devoured in a heartbeat. But he enables us to go through those situations. He doesn't create the evil. He doesn't create the darkness. But where he wants to take us, we walk through there. And I tell you what, the longest way through a trial is to try to do it apart from the Lordship of Jesus. The quickest way through a trial is with Jesus as Lord. There's only one shortcut, Jesus as Lord. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. I want you to look at it again. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not evil, to give you a future and a hope. And that verse is such a broad reaching promise of the Lord. It's quoted often by, you know, preachers that I hear through the years, and rightfully so. It's just one of those It's one of those gems that's just tucked away in a very uh, difficult setting. And uh, and I'm so thankful for this decree that the Lord makes. I know the thoughts that I think about you. They're not thoughts for your calamity. They're for your blessing. They're for your welfare. Interestingly, this word peace in this passage is uh, also translated prosperity. It's translated health. It's just overall well-being. And it is, the, it is what is on the mind of God about us in the middle of this situation that we're in. We're going to read a context here that I think long-term can give us a wonderful, wonderful hope. And for me, if, if you know anything about how I function in my life, whenever something comes up, I run. I don't walk. I run to the promises of the Lord. I run to what has God spoken to me? What has he said to me last? What is it that he has deposited in my heart about this season? Most people could, you you would do well if you just returned to the last thing God told you. But sometimes because of anxiety and fear and all the junk that goes on in our lives, we we tend to drop the things that God has given us. And uh, we can't afford to do that right now. We've got too many things swirling And I'm going to ask you, as I mentioned in this video, we've got to return to the strongest absolutes in our life. And that is this right here. I know the thoughts I have towards you. It's thoughts of a father, a perfect father. 
a perfect father who is wonderfully good. And it was that one theme, that one thought that brought Jesus to earth to take on flesh, to take on the cross, and to raise again. Everything that he did was to reveal the Father. And so this is not a side issue. This is the core issue. It's all about the fatherhood of God in your life and in mine. And right now, I'm in a place where I'm going to emphasize being a son, a child, not the leader. That never stops. But hopefully you understand what I'm saying. Right now is where I take that hat off. I put it down. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm wearing the hat of a, of a child that, that really needs the father. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. We're going to read about 10 verses, so hang in there. I'm going to make uh, three kind of concluding thoughts, and then we'll wrap this, uh, this day up together. We're going to start with verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Stop right there. Please notice this wonderful promise where God says, I know the thoughts I have towards you was towards a group of people that were in captivity. They were held prisoner in another nation. Build houses, verse 5, build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may increase there and not diminish. So that the, the word of the Lord was, you're in captivity, but if you'll do this my way, you'll thrive there. Good. You'll thrive there. What, what you think is destroying your life is actually going to be the platform for your greatest promotion. And so we've, we've got to repent and shift, change the way we think and perceive situations that you may be increased there and not diminished. Verse 7, and seek the peace of the city. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible because it, I'll never forget when it hit me, oh goodness, 30, 35 years ago in Weaverville when we, we began to focus on the prayer for the benefit of our city and not thinking it's us and them. And this word peace, this is one of the places, I think it's in the New American Standard where it says, seek for the prosperity of the city. So let me read it with that word prosperity, verse 7. Seek the prosperity of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace or in its prosperity, you will have prosperity. There's something profound about this. In fact, if you're writing notes down, write down 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Because in that passage is a directive in prayer that was to bring the people of God into the abundance of peace and impact on culture itself. It's the most unusual parallel between this chapter and that one. All right? So for, uh, for in its peace, you will have peace. Verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets or your diviners who are in your midst deceive you. Here's an interesting phrase, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. It's a profound lesson by itself. I believe very much that the Lord speaks to us through dreams. I have, I've had so many critical times in my life where the Lord has has, has inspired a dream that's given me insight of what to do, things I didn't know what to do, and I woke up understanding because of a dream. I've had the Lord affirm me in dreams, very unusual, unusually. <clears throat> but when we hold to our agenda and there's an unwillingness to yield to the purposes of God, that bent or that desire in us will actually create its own dream in the night. It will actually cause there to be a dream that appears to be a prophetic dream when in fact it's not from the Lord at all. It's the offspring of your own unyielded desires. I believe strongly in the dream life. And the Lord speaks all through scripture and in my own experience. But just understand walking with a yielded heart to the purposes of the Lord. Song of Solomon, though I sleep, yet my heart is awake. That posture positions us 
to have divine dreams. All right, look at it again. The last part of verse eight. Nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I've not sent them, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, after 70 years I completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you, cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart and I will be found by you, says the Lord. Look at verse 13 again, and we'll wrap the reading up with this. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. It's interesting, Jesus used a very similar um, uh, language in the Gospel of John where he said, he said, I will be found by you. And he uses a word that says, I will make myself conspicuous. In other words, you're going to be going down the road looking and I'm going to jump in the middle of your path and do something like this so that you can't miss me. And we have that kind of a father who wants to be known and discovered by his own. The Lord makes a covenantal promise to you. And he says, if you search for me with all your heart, you'll find me. I will make sure that I'm in the middle of whatever road you're walking down and you will discover me. There will be that encounter that changes everything. Our life as disciples of Jesus, our our life as followers of the Lord is hinged upon us encountering him. It's not peripheral, it's not an addition to, it is life. His voice brings us life. We live because he talks. This word is the living word of God. He speaks in it and through it and he enhances and adds strength and life to us to carry out his purposes. But this story, this great grand promise that God gives, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, the thoughts I have for you. They're thoughts of your welfare, not your calamity. They, uh, to give you a future, to give you a hope. That pristine promise came at the most unexpected and awkward time. And it's the mercy of the Lord that regardless of whatever hell hole you think you're in right now, whatever the situation might be, if you'll calm your heart just a bit, Turn to the word of God. God will speak to you and bring a promise that is so opposite to your surroundings that it will shock you. It will stun you. Imagine being carried away captive, not willingly, unwillingly, bound, taken to another nation. You are now subservient to this ruling class of people. You are prisoners there. And the Lord comes to you and all you can see is the restrictions, the restraints, the problems. All you remember is what you left behind and what you lost, how it could have been, the promises you had over your life and they didn't come to pass. You got all this stuff swirling around you and the Lord steps into the middle of that absolute chaos and he says, I want you to know what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking really good thoughts about you and it's it's about your welfare. It's actually about your prosperity. I've got a lot of plans. I I daydream about you. And I think about these moments that are so difficult for you. But if you'll take just a moment, you'll rediscover the promise of the Lord. And I remind you of that psalm that is so uh, important to all of us, the 23rd Psalm. He says, I prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Think through that. I prepare a table. What's the table? The table is a place of exchange. The table is a place of fellowship. The table is a place to eat. It's a place of nourishment and strengthening. So the Lord says, I prepare this place of personal strength and personal encounter in the midst of your enemies. And oftentimes we're overly mindful of what's not right. And we've lost sight of the very fact that the Lord put a table right in the middle of the most unexpected place. And we find it again in Jeremiah 29. I know the thoughts that I have towards you 
their thoughts of your, of your blessing, of your, your prosperity. I'm gonna bring you into wholeness. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring you into why you're on the planet in the first place. You'll not miss a thing. I'm bringing you back. 